Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons that's prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Daniel. Daniel is a book that Adventists have spent a lot of time studying and has had a real impact on our church. So um, we should pay special attention to this series. This is lesson number three in that series for January 18 of 2020, entitled From Mystery to Revelation. Wow, that sounds interesting. Let's see what that's about. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we bow now, asking your special guidance in the presence of your Holy Spirit. We know he's always here, but we ask for his special blessing and guidance in our discussions so that these texts, this part of Scripture, may be made as clear as possible to those who are listening in. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 For those who have been Seventh-day Adventists for years, you know that Daniel 2 has been a subject for sermons and evangelistic outreaches many, many times. And billboards and pictures depicting the statue of multiple substances has attracted a lot of attention. Even now, if you go to the Internet and you go to Google search and you just put in Google images and you ask, okay, show me the, the, the statue from Daniel 2 or something like that, and you'll see all kinds of different variations. So what's so important about that particular statue? It's not always possible to tell why certain things happen. One example might be icebergs that we see off the coast of Greenland. The smaller icebergs sometimes are moving in one direction, while um, the larger icebergs seem to be moving in a different direction. And, and the smaller ones seem to be probably moved by the winds, and while the larger, deeper ones seem to be moved by the underwater currents. And so... Things can go in different directions even though you may not be able to explain why it happened like that. World events are like that in many ways. It is impossible for us as human beings to predict what is going to happen next, but God knows. Ellen White stated it succinctly in these words, like the stars in the vast circuit of their appointed path, God's purposes, notice that word, God's purposes know no haste and no del delay. Desire of Ages 32. So how was it possible for God to predict the major events in human history from the days of Daniel all the way to the end and to do so accurately? Well, I think there's two elements. There's one, the ability to see the future, and he could be someone who was simply an observer who looks down and says this is going to happen. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Daniel in his prayer, as we'll see in a little bit, uh, indicates that God sets up kings and takes down kings. So he is actively in, involved mm -hmm. uh, in uh, things. So uh, there's a sense in which as long as you can control things, you can predict things also. My hand so will go up in two seconds. One, two. There it went. Did I foresee that or did I just have control over it? Yeah. So. There's there's a you know well, you, a bit of that. Yeah, it, and you you all you all know that the argument here is a question of if God is really in control, do we have any freedom? That's the real tough try to back and forth ethics. This guess this goes on for hours and hours in ethics classes. You know, do we have any freedom if God is really in control? Well, well, he c controls things according to his, uh, God's purposes, as she yeah. said there. And that was important. Which is uh, overriding and and, uh, and g could be discussed for hours. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the dream that is the subject of Daniel 2 was first given to Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan king and conqueror of much of the world, including God's people living in Babylon. Now, why would God give his this vision to somebody like that. Well, in his earlier years, Nebuchadnezzar was an absolute ruler. There's a British 19th century politician known as Lord Acton once stated, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. If that is true, and it certainly seems like it is sometimes, Nebuchadnezzar was certainly in a position to be susceptible to corruption since he had absolute power 
power. The morning after that, after having that dream, as an example, he called his top advisors and demanded that they tell him not only the interpretation of his dream, but also the dream itself because he could not remember it. And what happened when they couldn't interpret it, couldn't tell him? He got upset. When those advisors reasoned with him that what he, was, what he was asking was completely unreasonable, he exploded, saying if they could not give him the answer, they, were, they all would be killed. Now, let's be a little bit understanding here. These people claim to have direct connection with the, <coughs> quote, gods. Yeah. So if you claim to have connection with the gods and you can't answer a question that gods are supposed to know, what does that say? It's not from those gods. Wow. <laughs> well, Daniel, I have a question. Yeah. So, this is Nebuchadnezzar, the king, mm -hmm. who, if we jump forward in time to, ne to Daniel 4, mm -hmm. he's insane for seven years. Is yeah, that right? That's correct. Is this act of demanding that his wise men interpret dreams, is that a sign of being insane? <laughs> Carrie, do you want to demonstrate your <laughs> psychiatric skills? <laughs> uh, well, there's no question about the fact that that would not be, you would not expect that kind of response from a person who was thinking rationally yep. and, and so forth at the time. So I'm wondering if, if yeah. that wasn't an early sign of his uh, we're gonna, insanity. We're, well, we're going to see it. Well, go ahead. Well, he's uh, when you get really emotionally upset about something, you don't think rationally. You yeah. you react to things. Uh, you say stuff you didn't, you wouldn't otherwise say you, or mean. Yeah. And uh, the dream really had him uh, very concerned, very upset. Yeah, he was so troubled he didn't reason. Yeah. But God uses such insane situations to glorify His holy name. The man says, well, you guys, you you can tell uh, things that no one else knows. You have the power that no one else has. Come on, prove it to me. Yeah. And what, was that rational for him? He was the king. He could have but it's, said anything. It's, you know, there was some logic to his request. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, Daniel and his three friends had recently completed their training in the University of Babylon. Imagine being in the position of Daniel soon after doing so well on his final exams when someone knocks on his door and in effect says, the king has declared that you are to be killed. Hmm. And you would say, oh, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> wait, a minute, wait a minute. I don't think so. <laughs> wait a minute. We need to understand the context. Dreams were taken very seriously in, ancient, in the ancient world, especially if they seemed to imply some, some kind of terrible disaster. No wonder Nebuchadnezzar was so concerned. Fortunately for all of them, knowing that his God could reveal the dream, Daniel asked Arioch if he could have a little more time. Fortunately, Nebuchadnezzar was so anxious to find out about his dream that he was willing to grasp at any straw. He was very worried because his counselor said, told him, there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. So at that point in time, he said, well, what have you been trying to say to me all these years? You know? How old was Nebuchadnezzar when this happened? He was still very young. Still pretty young. Yeah. Well, for an emperor to declare that all of his top advisors were to be destroyed seems extreme to us. However, there are other examples from historical sources of something similar. Several years later, Darius I had all the Magi ex executed. Even later, Xerxes put to death the engineers who had designed a bridge that collapsed. Nebuchadnezzar seemed to be very angry when his advisors had asked for more time. But when Daniel requested more time, he promptly granted the request. Why do you think that was? Because he said he was going to give him an answer. <laughs> and not only that, Daniel had done what? Gotten his A on the final exam. He excelled at everything, right. yes. Plus God might have had some influence here. Yeah, yeah a little help from above. Yeah. So he was, he was influenced. Yeah. If we believe that only the true God is the one who can reveal the future, 
then we must have some special connection with the true God if we want answers, right? So how does God know the future? Does He control our free choices so that things will work out the way He says? Or does He have some method that we do not understand for predicting the future even though we have free choice? <coughs> and some people say, well, that, that just is impossible. And my comment is, well, if God doesn't, can't, ha, doesn't have any more, any more wisdom than I have, then He's not God. The fact that God could predict the history of our world down from those days through those four great world king empires and the nations of Western Europe all the way to the second coming of Jesus Christ precisely and without error is surely a mystery to us. I think there are some things, I think you're going to get into it in a minute, that that are, are uh, you know, if the person changes, yeah. you know, God says, I'm going to do this. So that's where free will comes in. But there are other things like the setting up and taking down of kings uh, that may have nothing to do with the person's free will. It's God... Uh, working behind the scenes and we don't uh, later on in Daniel we're going to see uh, where the angel comes Gabriel I think uh, to Daniel and says I've been I've been working okay. with the prince of Persia here for three three oh, weeks yeah. um, and that's why I'm late so yeah. so there's stuff and we don't really understand how that works yeah. you know but we're given a glimpse of something that that's a reality, apparently, in the spiritual realm. We don't know how this information about the death threat got to Daniel and his three friends, but I'm pretty sure that I could guess that when they got together after that announcement, they were on their knees praying together, saying, God, we know there's a reason for this. Help us to know what to do. And they pleaded with God to give them answers. No, How do you think? They had new status after they were able to yeah. do what no one else could do. How do you think they slept that night? Enough to have a dream anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, it says a vision. I don't know if there's a different word for vision versus dream. Let me just read those words. Yeah. Then Daniel went home and told his friend Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah what had happened. He told them to pray to the God of heaven for mercy and to ask him to explain the mystery to them so that they would not be killed along with the other advisors to Babylon. Then that same night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision, and he praised the God of heaven. God is wise and powerful. Praise him forever and ever. He controls the times and the seasons. He makes and unmakes kings. It is he who gives wisdom and understanding. He reveals things that are deep and secret. He knows what is hidden in darkness, and he himself is surrounded by light. I praise you and honor you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and strength. You have answered my prayer and shown us what to tell the king. So he didn't waste any time thanking God, did he? Looking so visions and dreams the same thing? No, not exactly. Visions yeah. are thing usually happen during the daytime when you're awake and and dreams happen at nighttime when so you're asleep. So he could have been praying and yeah. received a vision rather than been sleeping. Uh, looking at the miracle of Adventist educational system around the world in hospitals, one cannot help but really wonder how dedicated people of God spend their time on their knees, just like perhaps like Daniel did, and, yeah. uh, and look at the results. Daniel got not only the dream, but he got the interpretation could be that uh, at, once he got the interpretation and uh, praised God that they all went to sleep and had a good night's sleep. <laughs> That's also right. possible. When he woke in the morning, what do you think Daniel had to say to his three friends? Surely they had a praise session right there. Right. Right. In this brief story, we have two types of prayers mentioned, a good, a good thing to mention in passing. First of all, there was that pleading petition to save their lives. And then there was the response of thanksgiving and praise when the answer was given to them. How often do we pray and plead with God for some, for some answers? Do we come back when we find the answers and thank God as they did? It's an important thing to think about. Mm -hmm. Even under the worst of conditions, are we willing to let God do what is best for us, 
even though it may not be what we would like to see happen at that time. I mean, you wouldn't say if someone knocks on your door and declares that you're going to die, that isn't exactly the best of conditions, is it? Well, there are psalms which talk about this. We, won't, we don't have time to read them right now. Psalm 138 talks about that. In this psalm, the psalmist mentions some problems that he was concerned about. And then he rejoiced when God provided answers. And Daniel 2, 24 to 30, tells us what happened next. So Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had commanded to execute the royal advisors. He said to him, Don't put them to death. Take me to the king, and I will tell him what his dream means. At once, Arioch took Daniel into King Nebuchadnezzar's presence and told the king, I have found one of the Jewish exiles who can tell you your ma tell your majesty the meaning of your dream. So he's almost taking credit for this, right? The king said to Daniel, who was also called Belteshazzar, Can you tell me what I dreamt and what it means? Daniel replied, Your majesty, there is no wizard, magician, fortune teller, or astrologer who can tell you that. And the king says, Well, hold on a minute. What are you doing? Here? No. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has informed your majesty what will happen in the future. Now I will tell you the dream, the vision you had while you were asleep. While your majesty was sleeping, you dreamt about the future, and God, who reveals mysteries, showed you what is going to happen. Now this mystery was revealed to me, not because I am wiser than anyone else, but so that your majesty may learn the meaning of your dream and understand the thoughts that have come to you. That's a very humble and fair thing to say, right? I am sure that as soon as Daniel was cleaned up and ready and dressed in his best clothes, he went to Arioch and asked to be taken to the king. Try to imagine Nebuchadnezzar's response when Daniel effectively said, I can tell you your dream. Then Daniel stopped for a moment and reminded the king, Your Majesty, there is no wizard and so forth that what I just read. Notice that immediately Daniel said, While Your Majesty was sleeping, you dreamt about the future. In our day, most of those who try to interpret the book of Daniel do not believe that even God can predict the future. But some of the very first words out of Daniel's mouth were that this dream was about the future. The future. The future. So what happened next? He starts to explain. Your majesty, in your vision you saw standing before you a giant statue, bright and shining and terrifying to look at. Its head was made of the finest gold, its chest and arms were made of silver, its waist and hips of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. While you were looking at it, a great stone broke loose from a cliff without anyone touching it, struck the iron and clay, clay feet of the statue, and shattered them. At once the iron, clay, bronze, silver, and gold crumbled and became like the dust on a threshing foot place in the summer. The wind carried it all away, leaving not a trace, but the stone grew to be a mountain that covered the whole earth. Wow. To get the major content of the dream and its interpretation, surely Nebuchadnezzar was happy to realize almost immediately that Daniel had the correct dream. But some of what Daniel had to say would not have been pleasing to Nebuchadnezzar. He certainly did not want to think that one day his kingdom would be replaced by another, and then another, and another. But he recognized the dream when Daniel told it back to him. Yep. He says, that's right. That's yep. exactly what I saw. The good news for us in this dream did, is that... Did the, the king ever admit that he didn't remember his dream? Oh, yeah. He, he told the people, says, tell me what, tell me what I dreamt. I can't well, well was, was that a test of them? You know, was he testing or did he say, I can't remember? Oh. Or did he give Daniel the credit? Daniel's God. Uh, in, in the reading, I wasn't clear on that. But it was a, he was doing it just to test the people yeah. who were there I, I, I think he was pretending like he was testing the white, his wise men, but he really didn't know. Well, the good news for us is that the final scene shows a rock cut out without human hands from the high mountain, and it strikes a statue, grinding it to powder, and and going to become a kingdom that would endure forever, leaving no trace of the others. The major events portrayed in this vision given to Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel took place over a period of time from 605 B.C. down to 476 A.D. 
So we're going to look at those individual parts in a little bit later. But let's just review very quickly. From 605, 606 down to 539 was the kingdom of Babylon. Babylon. From 539 to 331. 331 was the kingdom of Greece. Middle Persia. Middle Persia. From 331 to 168 was the kingdom of Greece. Greece. And then from 168 to 476 A.D. was Rome. Rome. Gee, that's so 500 plus years, isn't it? More. 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 More than starts with 600 B.C. More than a and goes to 476 years. A.D. More, more than, than a thousand years. Yeah. Yeah. More than a thousand years. Wait a minute. The leg. We're talking about Rome. Or, 168 no. B.C. to A.D. 400. Are you talking right. about you asked asking about just 500 about the years. kingdom of Rome? Rome yeah. was about, about more, 500 than, years. more than 500 more than 500 years. Than 500 yeah. year. That's the lengthiest. Yes, it is. Well, with the demise of the Roman Empire, God said that there would never again be a single world power. But there will be a future kingdom in which people will live forever. That kingdom is open to all who are willing to follow God's plan for their lives. Wow. So now we need to talk about some details. In interpreting this dream, we must recognize up front that God's foreknowledge is complete and beyond <coughs> question. Daniel 2 is not a conditional prophecy. What's a conditional prophecy? What does that mean? That means that if, God says, if you don't change your ways, this and this will happen. Yeah. So it depends on some human behavior, yes. right? A conditional prophecy. This prophecy is an apocalyptic prophecy. And as if we studied in previous lessons, apocalyptic prophecies, boy, I'm having trouble with this, apocalyptic, <laughs> reveal events that have been predicted by God and which will come to pass no matter what any human being does. Do prophecies set out, set the Christian faith as unique when compared with any other faith in the yes. world? We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Let us review briefly the kingdom as represented by the different portions of the image. So now we're going to, we're going to go to some details. And Jackie, I think you can get us started with that. The head of gold represents Babylon. Indeed, no other metal could better represent the power and wealth of the Babylonian Empire than gold. The Bible calls it the Golden City and a golden cup in the Lord's hand. The ancient historian Herodotus reports that an abundance of gold embellished the city. By the way, you will notice that I mentioned that the kingdom of Babylon is from 606 down to 539. The, the lesson here actually has 626 down to 539 because it's dating from the time of Nabopolassar and Nebuchadnezzar's father. I was dating it from the time Nebuchadnezzar himself became king. So it's probably more correct to go back to the 626 because Nabopolassar was the one who really conquered much of the territory. Okay, Dennis? Two, the chest and arms of silver stand for Medo-Persia. Uh, 539 to 331 BC. As silver is va valued less than gold, the Medo-Persian Empire never attained the splendor of the Babylonian. <coughs> in addition, silver also was a fitting symbol for the Persians because they used silver in their taxation system. And Margaret? Okay, number three. The belly and thighs of bronze symbolizes Greece. 331 to 168 BC. Ezekiel 27.13 portrays the Greeks as bartering bronze vessels. Greek soldiers were noted for their bronze armor. Their, hel their helmets, shields, and battle axes consisted of brass. And what's the difference between brass and bronze? Uh, brass has iron in it. No, no. bronze. No, it's a combination. Oh, yeah, Copper. it's just it's a, a slight difference. Brass and bronze are almost the same. Yeah, one is... Yeah. One has copper in it, I think, and the other has, yeah. is it tin? Yeah. I don't know what. Anyway, Herodias tells us that, oh, Sam Metricus of one of Egypt saw an invading Greek pirates, saw, saw in invading Greek pirates the fulfillment of an oracle that fore foretold men of bronze coming from the sea. And I might tell you that um, if you 
have the opportunity to visit uh, Greece, go to the archaeological museum in Athens, and then if you have a real opportunity, go up to uh, Macedonia and visit the place where they have just recently discovered the burial place of Alexander's father, Philip. Philip. And you go down, it's underground. It's under a mound of dirt, and they have all, nobody had disturbed it. And the gold and the, the stuff that's in that tomb is amazing. It's almost, a, almost like um, King Tut. T Tutanka, well, yeah, King Tut. Yeah, Is from something re recent? I'm yeah, fairly recent. National Geographic have that? My I, would, I would have thought Google they would have, but I don't remember seeing that in National Discovery. Uh, yeah, my... Phillips tomb, just Google that and maybe find it. Probably, That yeah. sounds so interesting. Yeah, it was amazing. Yes. And, and several of his, one or two wives are buried down there as well, and maybe some servants, and it has, has his armaments, and incredible... Between the the archaeological museum in Athens and that place, the gold is stuff is just amazing, just amazing. My and son and I visited Greece in uh, 2015, mm -hmm. uh, just what four years ago, and and uh, we visited that tomb mm -hmm. also. I probably have the pictures in here. <coughs> yeah, we don't have time for that. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, a, a fantastic experience. Yeah. Okay. Well, the fourth part of it image that Neb saw, the legs of iron aptly represent Rome, which lasted from 168 B.C. to 476 A.D. As Daniel explained, the iron represented the crushing power of the Roman Empire, which lasted longer than any of the previous kingdoms. Iron was a perfect metal to represent the empire. And, Kerry? The feet partly of iron and partly of clay represent a divided Europe. Starting at A.D. 476 through to the second coming of Christ. So we're kind of living in that era. Yeah. Aren't we? The mixture of iron with clay provides a fitting picture of what happened after the disintegration of the Roman Empire. Although many attempts have been made to unify Europe, ranging from marriage alliances between royal houses to the present European Union, division and disunity have prevailed, and according to this prophecy will remain so until God establishes the eternal kingdom. And what is the final event in this great prophecy, Charles? Daniel chapter 2, verse 34, 35, and... Uh, Verses 44 and 45. While you are looking at it, a great stone broke loose from a cliff without anyone touching it and struck the iron and clay feet of the statue and shattered them. At once the iron, clay, bronze, silver and gold crumbled and became like the dust on the threshing place in the summer. The wind carried it all away, leaving not a trace. But the stone grew to be a mountain that covered the whole earth. And the time of those rulers, the God of heaven, will establish a kingdom that will never end. It will never be conquered and will completely destroy all those empires and then last forever. You saw how a stone broke loose from a cliff without anyone touching it and how it struck the statue made of iron, bronze, clay, silver and gold. The great God is telling you, Majesty, what will happen in the future. I have told you exactly what you dreamt and have given you its, its true meaning. Good wow. news Bible. Yes, wow. There are several important things to notice about the components of this image. The ultimate focus is still in the future, future, in the days when God will establish His eternal kingdom. You know, you might be amazed that Rome ruled for 500 years, but in light of eternity, that's a peanuts. Yeah. The main components of the image are all things which human beings could produce and mold into <laughs> almost any form they wanted. 
but the rock which was carved out of the mountain without hands and which destroys the great metal and clay image and grinds it to powder symbolizes a kingdom established by God himself. In fact, what's the proof of the fact that human hands can make almost anything from some of these substances? Nebuchadnezzar made a whole image similar out of gold a little while later, right? Mm -hmm. There are many places in the scripture where God and his kingdom are represented by a rock. Let me just mention a few. Deuteronomy 32.4 says, The Lord is your mighty defender, your rock, perfect and just in all his ways. Your God is faithful and true. He does what is right and fair. For Samuel, well, and anyway, I'll let you... First Samuel 2, 2, Psalm 81, 13, 31, 18, 31, I'm sorry. And there's a whole bunch of verses that talk about that. The Messiah himself is represented as stone in places like Psalm 118, 22 and 1 Peter 2, 4 through 7. So, some argue? Some argue that the stone kingdom was established during Jesus' earthly ministry and that the propagation of the gospel stands as an indication that the kingdom of God has taken over the entire world. Yet, the stone kingdom be- comes into existence only after the four main kingdoms have fallen and human history has reached the time of the divided kingdoms, represented by the feet and toes of the image. The fact rules out the, fi- f- excuse me, rules out the fulfillment during the first century because Jesus' earthly ministry took place during the domination excuse me under the dominion of Rome the fourth kingdom but the stones give away excuse me but the stones give way to a mountain that is the stone that struck the image becomes became a great mountain and fulfill excuse me filled the gr- whole earth Daniel 235 King New King James version a mountain such as this evokes Mount Zion the place where the temple stood and the concrete representation of God's earthly kingdom of the Old Testament times. Interestingly, the stone cut from the mountain becomes the mountain itself. This mountain, which according to the text is already in existence, most likely points to the heavenly Zion, the heavenly sanctuary, where Christ, excuse me, whence Christ will come to establish his eternal kingdom. In the, Jerus- excuse me, in the Jerusalem that will come down from heaven, this kingdom will find its ultimate fulfillment. Okay, so some critics will, of course, most critics, and, and our less, I don't think the, our lessons will go into this, but most of the critics will, will say that the book of Daniel was not written by Daniel, they have claimed all sorts of craziness. Originally, they claimed that the language wasn't the language of Babylon's da- uh, of Daniel and Babylon, Babylonian times. It was a, 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 a Hebrew or an Aramaic of a much later time. That has been disproved completely. But they they claim that the that the book of Daniel was actually written by somebody else in the days of the uh, um, Maccabean revolt which is around 168 to 165 B.C., and therefore after most of these kingdoms had already done their thing, and so it wasn't a prediction of the future, it's just a, it was written as if it was a prediction of the future, but it's already talking about historical facts. Is that because they don't believe God has foreknowledge? That's because they don't believe even God can predict the future. But but even if what you say is true, there is still the feet and toes of clay and iron mixed, and the stone cut out from without hands. Not only that, we come to the New Testament and Jesus talks about the prophecy of Daniel as still being future. Oops, there's a problem. So if you're going to say that this is the interpretation, you're calling Jesus a liar. That's why you have a problem from last week, or yeah, two weeks ago, Lesson of a quotation from the Talmud, yeah. you know, the the curse that they put on anybody Daniel. that reads the reads the yeah. book Daniel, of Daniel chapter nine verse uh, twenty four to twenty seven. Yeah, that's the curse exactly. So it's important for us to notice that Nebuchadnezzar's dream is, as interpreted by Daniel, has been fulfilled in every particular so far. Is there any reason to doubt? 
the truthfulness, the truthfulness of the final action? Notice these two comments about the inevitability of God's predictions about the future. This from, uh, as quoted in the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, but by William Shea. Although to the unaided human eye, the human history may appear to be a chaotic interplay of forces and counterforces, <coughs> Daniel assures us that behind all of this stands God, looking down upon it and moving within it to achieve what he sees best. Okay, now I'm going to interrupt for a second while well, you finished reading that already, but how does that happen in light of the fact that we're in the midst of a great controversy? Does God just knock the devil out of the way and say, I'm going to do this now? Evil has to be shown what, as what really is. Okay. God is not a so manipulator. So does that mean God stands back? And then if he stands back, how can he predict what's coming? Well, us finite creatures have a hard time trying to show what the limits are of the infinite one. Mm -hmm. so. Daniel says he he sets up kings and takes down kings, so he is actively involved in in things. And as I mentioned earlier in Daniel ten, I think it is Gabriel comes and relates mm -hmm. this story, this backstory that uh, he was pleading with the prince of Persia. So there's stuff going on that we have no. Uh, way to tap into, except that they sort of bubble to the surface when somebody as close to God as Daniel was uh, relates them. So, what we're seeing here is humans think they have a lot of power, especially some, and they they see all this kind of stuff going on, and it seems like there's a war, and one nation wins, and somebody else loses, and all this kind of stuff is going on. But behind the scenes, what's going on? We have a great controversy going on. And God, I mean, there is clearly times in uh, an example of, of that is the civil war here in America. And the, the, that civil war changed direction dramatically at the point when President Lincoln signed into law the Emancipation Proclamation. Almost immediately, the, the progress of the war, which is going north, Turn around and, and the South started losing. Uh, there are other, there's many other examples where God clearly gets involved in human history. And in our personal lives, the Lord says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Yeah. Then he says, how can I give you up, Ephraim? Well, Ellen White makes a comment that goes along with what Dr. Shea recently Gordon read about. In the annals of human history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires, and peers dependent on the will and prowess of man. The shaping of events seems, to a great degree, to be determined by his power. This is man's power, ambition, or caprice. But in the word of God, the curtain is drawn aside, and here we see it in Daniel 2 for sure, and we behold behind, above, and through all the play and counterplay of human interests and power and passions, the agencies of the all-merciful one silently, patiently working out the counsels of his own will. So who's ultimately in charge? God oh, is. God. And how That's does a it... a beautiful bit of wordsmithing. Yeah, fantastic bit of... White Education 173. Absolutely. When you read that, that's yeah. just amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What well, does it make you feel more comfortable to know that God is ultimately in charge? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So we have noticed something else, and Jackie, I think you have some words about that. Some have argued that the stone cut out without hands refers to the spreading of the gospel to the world. And Jim had read us something about that, so tell us more. That can't be right for a number of reasons, including what Daniel 2.35 says, which is that the stone will crush the previous nations and that the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. So what would that mean? What's going to happen when it, they're crushed and carried away? There would be no Greece. There would be no Rome. There would be no Medo-Persia. There would be no Babylon. Right. Right? Right. Okay. 
That did not happen after the cross. Furthermore, some attempts to identify the stone kingdom with the church fail to note that the stone kingdom replaces all other forms of human dominion. Exactly. It is a kingdom that encompasses the whole world. Therefore, only Jesus' second coming can set in motion the process portrayed as the climax of this prophetic dream. Why, then, is the second coming of Jesus the only sensible interpretation of what the stone does in the end of days? Well, we Adventists have always taught that this stone represents the second coming of Jesus when he was going to come. And it says he's going to send a, he's going to set up an everlasting kingdom. Where's the everlasting kingdom? That wipes out all the kingdoms of the earth. Yes, Hasn't happened. Not yet. Hasn't happened. Kingdom of glory. Yeah. Um, studying in Revelation chapter 20, 21, 22, um, second, kingdom, second coming perhaps is a prelude to the real action that happens a thousand years later. Yeah. Final end of sin and sinner. Yeah. And then the kingdom. Yes. We have a form taste of it in second coming. Yeah, you know. Second. It's very right. interesting in light of what it's we've been what, yes. we, what we've been studying here to go back and review what some people call second Isaiah or the second part of Isaiah from chapter forty to fifty five. And in that there's a bunch of chapters, a bunch of arguments about how do you pick out the real God? And Isaiah is just amazing, the stuff he talks about. You know, it's funny to read it because it says, you sit down and you pick yourself a log and you cut it up and you so sh shape part of it in, into a human form and you bow down to it and you take yeah. the rest and you, you cook your dinner. Warm your body. Warm your, your body too, yeah, in other places. And so, you know, and all the way through this, and, and in that, in those chapters, he says, "Okay, there are certain ways that you can predict. You can find out who the real God is, and there's two inalienable ways that you can detect. And what are those two ways? Predicting the future, be able, to, being able to predict the future far in advance. And he just says, "Okay, you gods, which one of you predict predicted what's happening right now? Show me where you predicted it a hundred years ago." And the other reason, the other excuse, explanation he gives? Create out of nothing. The ability to create out of nothing. He says, if you show me a God who can do those two things, I will show you the true God. Was he speaking to Israelites or was he speaking... And why was he talking like that to Israelites? Because they, were, they had idols. They had made themselves idols and were worshipping them. Exactly. We read earlier that under every tree, every green tree, I mean, that just blows me away. Well, we need to think about three major issues in connection with, the, uh, with this story. What were the circumstances surrounding the dream? Oh, boy. My thing has gone funny here. Anyway, that's okay. I'll manage. Uh, connection with this, dream, with this story? One, what were the circumstances surrounding the giving of the dream? Number one. Number two, what was the significance of the dream? Number three, what was the scope of the dream? When you think about Daniel 2, how does it impact you personally? Do you feel that you can trust a God who knows thousands of years ahead of time exactly what is going to happen? Does it bother you that he presents that information in a symbolic way using images and stones? Well, one issue we must deal with in talking about Daniel 2 is the um, hold on here is the question about the date. We are told that Nebuchadnezzar had his dream in the second year of his reign, which would have been 603 B.C. Remember that we are to uh, we are told in Daniel 1 that Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah during the first year of his reign, but Daniel and his three friends attended the University of Babylon. For three years. So, it might seem at first glance that there's a conflict between because how could he have finished his three-year training be that be began in the first year and that the, uh, of that king when he was in his second year. 
The answer is shown by the following table from our Bible study guide. And here you have a look at it. So, Daniel's training versus Nebuchadnezzar's reign. The first year of his training occurred during what is known as what? The accession year of, of, of you know, that ha that's the same time when he invaded Judah. Now, what do we mean by an accession year? The year he came into the throne. Okay. So, they had a funny system there, and, and, and there's some sense, we can make some sense of it. They said that, okay, the king or the emperor who marches in the, in the, in the uh, New Year's Day parade is the one who gets credit for that year. So even if you die that afternoon, if you march in that parade that day, that's your year. And then if your son takes over during that year, that is called his accession year. In other words, the year he becomes king. But he hasn't marched in the parade yet, so he can't claim that as his year. So then the second year of their captivity is his first reigning year, or his first regnal year, as they would call it. And then their third year then becomes his second reigning year, the year of the dream. So if you understand that way of keeping track of history, um, there is no problem. Nebuchadnezzar was very busy during his first year of emperor. emperor. We already talked about one thing he did during his first year. What was that? Judah. He conquered Judah. He actually had to travel all over, the, all the way over there with his army, conquer it, and come back. And he had, he beat the Egyptians in the process. But he had Egypt to deal with too. Yeah. yeah. So it was actually the Battle of Carchemish. First. And then a side thing was conquering yeah. Babylon, conquering yeah. Judah. Jerusalem. More than that, he had to make sure that there were no significant challengers. I mean, those were the days when if you could dock off the guy who was claiming the throne, then you could be the next ruler. More than that, he also had to make sure that there was no nation under his control that was trying to take advantage of this transition of power. Under such circumstances, it is not surprising Nebuchadnezzar was disturbed by this dream. The Babylonians made a great science of dream interpretation. They put together large collections of books describing how interpretation of dreams should be done. The king kept a group of experts um, who were supposed to be able to interpret dreams. Notice this particular comment. Quick question. Yeah. Um, it's, Judah looks like even though they have been defeated again and again, they're still there. Uh, but the people who troubled them in the past, like Philistines and Amorites and Jebusites and Moabites, they're gone. They're gone. Hmm. That's right. Okay. In the ancient Near East, the diviners were the academic and religious leaders of the day. As Berossus' history of Babylonia relates, Mesopotamians uh, believed that the gods had gifted people with knowledge, but they did not give them all knowledge. Divine knowledge remained inaccessible except through encoded messages that required the expertise of diviners. If the account of Emma Duranki—that's a crazy name, isn't it? Emma Duranki, all right, can be taken seriously. Mesopotamians believed that diviners were only able to decode messages because the gods gave them the interpretations. This okay, so what does that teach us? <coughs> what, what, what are we supposed to learn about the Daniel story from that passage? See, these, these diviners, these supposedly wise people believe that only God knows the messages, but they were given in forms that needed to be interpreted by the diviners. So what's, what's the problem with our Daniel story? What was their problem? They couldn't contact the gods. And supposedly they were supposed to be the ones who could, could contact the gods and get that information and properly interpret it. So they failed. But although God had chosen to give Nebuchadnezzar this important dream, he, he also arranged it so that Nebuchadnezzar could not remember the dream. Now, 
Gordon, you raised some questions about that, but whatever, he did, he wasn't willing to disclose it if he remembered it. That gave God an opportunity to introduce Daniel. Now, it looked like Judah had been defeated, that their God was no good whatsoever, and now what's what's happening? Guess who, guess who can interpret the dreams? The God that you thought was just defeated, right? The only God who really can come through. One thing that appears almost immediately about the significance of the dream, Margaret? That would be, in the history of nations, the student of God's word may behold the, lit- the literal fulfillment of divine prophecy. Babylon, shattered and broken at last, passed away because in prosperity its rulers had regarded themselves as independent of God and had ascribed the glory of their kingdom to human achievement. The Medo-Persian realm was visited by the wrath of heaven because in it God's law had been trampled underfoot. The fear of the Lord had found no place in the hearts of the vast majority of the people. Wickedness, blasphemy, and corruption prevailed. The kingdoms that followed were even more base and corrupt, and these sank lower and still lower in the scale of moral worth. This is Ellen G. White, Prophets and Kings, page 501.3 to 502. Well, clearly this massive statue was something which was somewhat familiar to Nebuchadnezzar. After all, it was not long before he tried to put up a massive statue on the plain of Dura, one made completely of gold. So the idea of massive statues wasn't a surprise. Excuse me. It was also known that even prior to the days of Nebuchadnezzar, that different metals were used to represent different historic epochs. For example, see Hesiod, which was about 700 BC. Someone had done something similar. But one aspect of the dream was completely new to Nebuchadnezzar. And what aspect was that? The rock. The rock. rock. That being carved out of the mountain without human hands, which destroyed the image and filled up the whole world. And actually, that's the part of the dream that, as I was, as I've studied this in the past, that hasn't been emphasized. Yeah, it was always these down to the toes, you know, the head down to the toes, and all the details of the different kinds yeah. of metals and all this kind of stuff. But what's the real point of this dream? The mm-hmm. kingdom that's going to last forever. Guess who's in charge? Mm-hmm. What's the scope of the dream? We need to note that the dream portrayed an image representing the history of the world from Nebuchadnezzar's day down until the second coming of Jesus and later. But God did not allow Nebuchadnezzar to remember the dream so that his dream interpreters could try their hand at interpreting it. Then Daniel was introduced into the sequence, reminding us that only God is able to predict the future. It might seem that much of what was represented by this gold, silver, bronze, iron, etc. image is still present in our world. But a more careful look will remind us that we are past the toes and we are awaiting that stone to come from the mountain. Finally, we need to recognize that Daniel's prayer of thanksgiving with his three friends is recorded in Daniel 2, 20-22. Let's just review that. Remember when they Daniel woke up in the morning he realized that he had been given the dream and the interpretation and this was their response. God is wise and powerful Praise Him forever and ever. He controls the times and the seasons. He makes and unmakes kings. It is He who gives wisdom and understanding. He reveals things that are deep and secret. He knows what is hidden in darkness and He Himself is surrounded by light. So, this is really the focal point of the chapter. It is God who is in charge throughout history. Do you think God has ever communicated anything to you in a dream? Mm -hmm. Yes. You bet. Where you're awakened in a night and impressed, he impresses you to pray for somebody and you don't know why, and then you find out later that something was happening. There's some amazing experiences in the Adventist church where Ellen White woke up in the middle of the night and wrote things that needed to be written. And that was in Australia, and they had to be transported all the way to America, and they arrived there at the right time. wonder who arranged that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no airplanes and nothing fast. No airplanes. No email. No email. Months. <sighs> months. Yeah, months, months in advance. If Three everything, months, probably. if everything clicked exactly right, it would take six weeks. Yeah. Hmm. 
So, what do we learn? It is God who's in charge throughout history. Could one of us fulfill an important mission in the history of our world as Daniel did in his day? Can we trust the predictions that have been given about the history of our world even though they were given so many years ago? I mean, those ancient people, what do they know, right? <coughs> well, it's, see, that's, that's where the scholars would say that uh, you have to interpret things in terms of what the writer knew at the time. Mm -hmm. And how could he know anything about yes. the future? You know, it's all very humanistic. Yes. Uh, so uh, we, can, um, we can trust those predictions because it was God who was behind them, not because Daniel was yep. that much more clever necessarily. It was because God revealed it. He was the revealer of secrets. So are there challenges facing the Adventist church or even us as individuals that require God-given wisdom? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Boy, our church, all of us, right now. <coughs> needs us some tremendous wisdom. Are we comfortable asking God for direct guidance? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason why should, we should be reticent to do that? No? Does understanding Daniel 2 help you to live a Christian life more comfortably? Well... Mm. Why has the Adventist Church made so much use of Daniel 2 in our evangelistic approaches? Any idea? No. That gives us a reason for existence, really, who we are. Uh, we, it's a great, mm. it's great news. It's yeah. a great that news. God is in control. Yeah. And yeah. Jesus mm. will come and he will reign. What else to talk about? Yeah. <laughs> That's well, right. I mean, if you to a, an ordinary person who thinks that everything is going on right now in the history of our world, and no, but you, to to think that all of a sudden somebody was there, you know, twenty five hundred years ago, and he predicted, boom, 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 boom. Look at this. I mean, it. Mm -hmm. I know it makes people sit up and think. This look behind the scenes, yeah. I think, is very persuasive to a young mind. It was to me when I was young. Yeah. Part of the reason I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. It yeah. makes sense. Okay, we're out of time. We leave you with that thought. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to study your word, to read about times like these experiences with Daniel and his three friends and from going from mystery to revelation and from having your life threatened to being elevated to the highest positions in the kingdom. What, a, what an incredible story. So help us to remember that you are in charge, even of our individual lives, every day that we may honor you and glorify your name is our prayer in Jesus' name.